Um, yeah, the last thread of strategy was the original title. Uh, I, I kind of was um, tracing the word strategy in Rancière's work uh, and had some kind of difficulties with this, so I think it would have taken way too long to expound. So I'm, I'm going to do more or less the same paper without focusing on the strategy point quite as much. So maybe for, for later or for the publication or something, I can do that. So <clears throat> the last thread um, uh, could be described as another Rancierian exercise in historicizing dissensus. That is in historicizing a certain untimeliness. In this case, is the untimeliness of modern fiction, uh, of the revolution in fiction brought about, among others, by Flaubert through to Conrad Wolf. And he also talks in, in, the, in the last thread about, uh, about Keats and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, playwrights such as Matalink and Ibsen and so on. But I would deal basically with the, the fiction part. So anyway, historicizing this census, what does this mean? It means something like setting up a historical narration in a way that what happens does not just resemble a pile of data, but instead takes on the consistency and shape of a singular event. Only then is it possible to see the dynamic that this event sets in motion, to understand its possible consequences, the way it's extended in historical moments, vastly different contexts, and by the same token, once its own dynamic and temporality is thus understood, only then can we properly grasp its prehistory. In this case, the prehistory is that of the poetics of fiction as it was bequeathed to us from Aristotle. Aristotle argued, as you know, that fiction must be distinguished from the mere succession of things as they happen from the pile of data. If poetry is more philosophical than history, it is because it is a structure of rationality with a beginning, a middle, and an end, with a whole which subordinates the parts to the whole, uh, in which there's a structure of action which is unfolded towards an end, and, and so on. Now, but while both Rancière and Aristotle, in some sense, uh, seek to account for the specificity of fiction as opposed to the pile of data, as I'm calling it, the untimeliness that Rancière seeks to historicize evidently involves a displacement of the Aristotelian paradigm by showing, through Flaubert and others, that this supposed outside of fiction, i.e. the succession of things as they happen, uh, has a consistency, or has been given a consistency, and has had a space created for it that makes modern fiction modern fiction, precisely. But in order to understand how this event of realist fiction emerges and how it breaks with the paradigm of poetic or representational fiction, we must grasp the new objects and new subjects that appear over and against the representational world. And it's this which permits us to say that something really happened in realist fiction, that there was a genuine break with the representational regime, and so on. Much contemporary discussion about realist fiction is usually accessed to some degree through modernist or structuralist analyses, of which Barthes, uh, Sartre, and so on are exemplary exponents. The problem is that the precise terms of engagement of these discourses runs counter to grasping realism as a genuine event, missing what Rancière calls the relation between the population of fiction and the structure of fictional action. This relation is twofold, or rather split in two. There's a representational regime of fiction posits one sort of population and corresponding structure of uh, literary fiction, or fictional action. And the aesthetic regime of literary fiction, which as we know, invokes another sort of population uh, and structure, or rather dynamic. Furthermore, as Rancière argues, because Batian analysis fails to take this relation into account, it also misses another idea of the relation between the poetics of fiction and its politics, which, which we'll come to. Now, to see this, let's take up the Batsian account, uh, and in particular, his notion of the reality effect. What is the reality effect? Very schematically, it's Bart's way of interpreting the appearance in realist literature of a certain excess, 
namely the excess of description over the dynamics of narrative action. Now, as we see in Barthes' writing on Flaubert, for example, structuralist analysis somewhat overdetermines the matter by describing details that exceed narrative structure as superfluous, i.e. useless from the point of view of the narratives, uh, the dynamics of narrative action. But as structuralist analysis must account for the entirety of the textual surface, Barthes claims that this descriptive excess has as its function being functionless, as kind of non-superfluous superfluity. It's not sustained by any structure of rationality in the narrative, and as such, its function is simply to say, I am the real. In other words, to contribute to a reification of reality, which Barthes, along with Sartre and others, interprets as an imaginary effect with a political function. For the result is naturally to reduce fiction to an imaginary and effective reality, precisely, and to reabsorb realist fiction as such into strategies of bourgeois politics, whose reality of objects, consumption, and so on, it deformedly expresses. We see that the, we see that the realist novel is cast as having an entirely negative function, there's some kind of critical function going on, but I want to emphasize this negative part. It, it contributes to the sort of thingifying or the petrification of living human relations and struggle in a sort of bourgeois bid to quell the aspirations of the, of the proletariat. It may, be construed as a, it may be construed on the one hand as a kind of literature that helps to uh, decode feudalist hierarchies to have cleared the way somewhat by introducing ordinary everyday people into the space of literature, but it's claimed that this is done ultimately in order to cement the place of the ascendant bourgeoisie. Thus aligned on a certain so-called progressist narrative, realist fiction is characterized as having a negative or destructive effect without veritable creation. As the story goes, is only when modernism understood as the autonomy of signifying processes comes along that the genuine dimension of creation occurs. This is the, the line that Barthes took when his concern was to dismantle in Brechtian fashion bourgeois mythologies. As Rancière recalls, this situation altered 10 years later as Barthes sought to give the reality effect a positive twist in his work on Camera Obscura. The point here is that this instability of the reality effect in Barthes is suggestive of a problem in dealing with descriptive excess. Digging further through the layers of historical <clears throat> descriptive strata, Rancière takes us back to the views of the 19th century critics of Flaubert and others. Barbie uh, is one of these critics, state, puts the problem of details in another and very blatant way. For him, the problem is not the excess of details that state their reality, that profess I am the real. <clears throat> the problem is that in Flaubert's books, there are nothing but details. <laughs> the problem is thus, that they are not books at all. The critic longing for the social hierarchies of yesteryear sees that something has happened in the space of literature, but this something is to be entirely rejected and it's entirely negative. He, sees, he gives it an interesting name though, democracy in literature, which of course he meant in an entirely pejorative sense. For this critic, democracy in literature pertains to an excess of details that works only to clutter the space of narrative action, leaving more of a pile of data without consistency or shape. It, pay, it pertains to the emergence of a certain sensible equality an excess of unworthy characters that do not permit the space in which the gold souls of the elites would be able to unfold their refined feelings. While this way of seeing things certainly differs from Barthes' insistence on the reality effect, what they both emphasize, in a certain sense, is the negative dimension of realistic fiction judged externally. One sees its excess as a rupture with the good order of elite distinction through fictional representation, the other as a petrification of life, as a reification of the present into an eternal present, uh, informing a strategy of bourgeois, uh, of bourgeois politics. 
However, the destruction particular to realistic fiction is not merely a negative term waiting either suppression or else a genuine leap of modernist creation. Instead, its structure of destruction, its structure of destruction, is imminent, which is to say that it's at once a positive means of construction and an activity provided with its own narrative and temporality. With Rancière, if we want to grasp the process of creative destruction, uh, or perhaps rather destructive creation, then we have to come back to the relation of the population of fiction and its structure of fictional action. Is this relation that the 19th century critic sees clearly? The excess of details is, in Aristotelian fashion, strictly correlated for him to the excess of people. In denouncing the Flaubertian novel as a mere succession of things that happen, unstructured by the logics of narrative action, we can hear the echo of the people to whom things merely happen, the people locked in the cycle of menial tasks and reproduction, distinctively unable to devise grand ends and flaunt fine feelings. What Rancière notes, this critic misses, this critic, <coughs> what, as Rancière notes, this critique uh, misses, however, is that the point of modern fiction is not that it has cluttered its space with too many peoples to whom things merely happen, squeezing out the golden souls of elite distinction. The issue is that the old space of fiction and the division of humanity into two on which it is based is rendered inoperative. For Rancière, the excessive details no longer pertains to a simple outside of poetic rationality. And if this is so, it's because it rests on a fundamental thing, namely, the fact that anyone at all can be the subject of a novel, the fact that any woman from the poor classes is able to experience the heights of passion formerly denied her, actively subverting the hierarchy of subjects, genres, and so on. And the example he gives of this is, uh, is Felicité in uh, A Simple Soul, Un Coeur Simple, uh, by Flaubert, in which the ordinary uh, servant uh, is so devoted to serving her mistress that this, this very uh, excess of passion turns into a sort of dangerous perversion, a very useless kind of dangerous perversion. But in doing so, um, uh, shows that she has, in fact, more of a capacity to feel emotion and so on than her, than her mistress. Anyway, it really indistinguishes uh, social classes along, along these lines. This means that a new equality of experiences, sensations, objects, etc., now exists. As Rancière definitely puts it, the reality effect is thus better named an equality effect. But just as political equality does not mean that all opinions are equal, nor does this equality imply the equivalence of all individuals' sensations and so on. Modern fiction implies a certain ontology but is not an ontological situation in the way that mathematics is for Alain Badiou, uh, for example. The equality of all things is precisely to be understood as the equality of all things under the writer's pen, or more precisely, is the equality shown in the rightly triggering, triggering of an exceptional and singular process that dismantles the social distinctions on which old fiction rested. This is, the singular, this is what I want to point out, is the singular universal form proper to uh, creative destruction, or rather the form that destruction takes when it is viewed imminently and not, from the, uh, not judged externally from, uh, via political criteria or something like that, but when it's looked at uh, as, as a process that is imminent to literature itself. <clears throat> So, as a, as a, again, as a process is imminent and not as a sort of like reducible to some global process of commodification or fragmentation happening outside it. So, if this process of uh, indistinction can happen, however, it's because the logic of actions and passions is now shot through with a logic of affect that undermines the primacy of action, so crucial to the representational regime. What the famous episode of Madame Bovary shows the one in which Emma is at the fair uh, with Rudolf, who's trying to uh, court her, trying to seduce her, and uh, employing all his know-how in order to do that. 
And the scene famously ends with her surrendering her hand. It, it's, it's precisely a hand surrendering itself and not her doing it. It's a kind of condensation of all the, of all the uh, uh, sensations and so on that happen outside her that she perceives. It's just the perceptible reality of the scene and which kind of like uh, crystallizes itself in this hand giving itself up. Okay, and this is what, this is what uh, um, uh, has been referred to as the shower of atoms. So it's a shower of atoms which is crystallized in, in action, and it's not, on the contrary, the, uh, the thoughts that precede actions which give rise to, uh, to those actions themselves any longer. This is the, the kind of uh, uh, shift that Flaubert, Flaubert makes. Now, resituating the reality and effect as an effect, as an equality effect, comes down to underdoing the representational idea that fiction is identifiable with the imaginary, and instead opposing two logics of the real. On the one hand, the Aristotelian logic of the plot, in which the real is a space of strategic uh, deployment of thoughts and wills. On the other, the real is a chain of perceptions that, and, and effects that weave these thoughts and wills themselves. On the one hand, a real in which the action is the content of the plot and the medium of its expression, and on the other, the lived fabric of a world that indistinguishes the elites and commoners, that produces scenes of inaction, precisely it's not her acting on her hand, it's a sort of action which happens in a kind of state of inaction, of hands which surrender themselves, which are not uh, immo immobile tableaux, because we are dealing with differences, displacements, and condensations of intensities through which the external world penetrates minds and through which these minds make up the lived world. Realism is thus about producing a new texture of the real, about this new weave of sensible events, of affects, sensations, and so on. If it has a demystifying function, it is thus to denounce the lie of strategic mastery. I mean, the name realism it has this kind of, kind of epistemological claim, uh, many have argued. And perhaps this is, this is what it is, it's to denounce the lie of strategic mastery and the primacy of action in the representational regime. Yet Flaubert, at the same time, reduces the power of the sensible weave by subordinating it again to the matter of the plot. He affects a kind of substitution. Instead of wills and thoughts, is now the sensible shower of atoms rendered in the linking power of phrases that powers the progression of the story of provincial mores. Rudolf, in other words, can still think that it was actually his scheming that got the girl. Um, Flaubert himself, the artist, knows that wasn't true, but he can, he can think it was. So you have... <coughs> I'd like to just, just make a little aside here, uh, which I haven't quite established, but I think you can see the parallel. Um, I want to suggest that by relocating this excess of literature to itself, Rancière gives us a way to see Barthes' structuralist enterprise as something like an attempt to tame the excess, rather than an attempt to account for the entire surface of literary fiction in terms of narrative functions. Perhaps it makes more sense to see it as a reinscription of the representational regime against the backdrop of the aesthetic revolution, which it attempts unsuccessfully to contain. And thus we see that the true opposite of the reactionary 19th century critic is not a modernist or structuralist critic uh, or theoretician, but rather an attempt such as Rancière's to grasp the real rupture affected by realist fiction. To return to this rupture then, is Conrad who radicalizes this, the aesthetics of the detail, turning the shower of atoms that powers the plot into a halo surrounding the plot, that the plot itself is supposed to illuminate. Uh, the famous scene now of, uh, uh, in Lord Jim, uh, where uh, Jim the sailor jumps into the, into the ocean. He's on a boat of sleeping pilgrims who he's supposed to be taken care of and, and, and leaps kind of incomprehensibly into the ocean. Uh, you, you all know the scene, more or less, I hope. Uh, anyway, so um, there's a whole, so we have, we have Sailor's Jim sleep, the whole series of impressions leading up to it. And this for, for Conrad is the mark of a kind of inevitability of being part of a universe we are unable to master. 
Jim's jump belongs only to the order of the real. The great nebula of sensible states unfold only to mark the cut of the inconceivable that separates it definitively from possible linkages of narrative action. Ronsi underscores how this act at once undoes his own heroic dreams, i.e. Lord Jim's heroic dreams, the mundane calculations of fellow sailors, and the positive rationality awaited by the judges in the trial. So it's, it's a way, again, of, of marking a certain inevitability which suspends all these kind of like, uh, plot-like functions. And this is expressed, uh, again, as the, the, the way in which this outside uh, of the, the novel in, in Aristotle as this, that, which just ha that which just occurs is given a kind of consistency uh, as what uh, Roncier calls the clarity of the detail. And I'll just give a little quote here. The clarity of the detail is the texture of the inevitable, it is the decomposition of a situation and an action into a multiplicity of sensible, sensible events which composes this situation's perceptible reality but it is also the limit placed on this decomposition, the punctuation of an encounter with the inconceivable that prevents this set of sensible actions from constituting the rationality of a situation and a sufficient reason of an action. The temporality of this limit situation differs fundamentally from the tripart division of old fiction into a, a past, present, future, or beginning, middle, and end. What Conrad's halo does is set us in the middle precisely in this milieu which has no meaning as such and where, where things happen but which, where things happen which cannot be uh, uh, described as a progression of narrative logic. So his, his uh, invention imposes a temporal construction that bursts asunder the normal temporality of progression of stories marks a co-presence of times, a kind of, a kind of collapsing of past, present, and future into a single present, which for Conrad is all there is. This present is woven from an encounter between the occasional hazards and circumstances, obsessive past fears, and future anticipations inhabiting heads, in which the chimera, i.e. his fears connected to unfulfilled dreams um, of heroism, uh, push him to act, and these acts themselves are not separated from the, separate, from the positive reasons for action. And this past present, which has kind of pushed him to jump, does not then cease to haunt the rest of the story. So, end, end quote. So I'm just going to conclude now. Uh, provisionally, let me say by way of conclusion, I've been, I've been reading Rancière for a while now, but I've... I, I've sort of only been recently struck by the way he continues to incorporate elements of his own trajectory in the fabric of, of his work. So perhaps this is something of a sort of Deleuzean heritage. In any case, doesn't this description of Jim's leap and of the Conradian artistic enterprise in highlighting these limit situations in which what is recounted is at once the, the limit of the recountable a reducible to being irreducible, sorry, to being unfolded as a causal chain of narrative events, and yet only able to be recounted, i.e. passed on through words, and even the only thing worth recounting, doesn't, does all this not recall Rancière's own enterprise? Rancière's younger days, of course, as we know, were mar as an intellectual, were guided by the twin imperatives to provide workers with an awareness of the system required to overcome their situation of oppression, and the need to learn from workers as an intellectual more about the conditions of their own oppression, etc. May 68 was the terrain of this encounter between intellectuals and workers. And for Rancière and his generation, it ended in disappointment, or at least it failed to be convincing. Pursuing these dreams through to their end, Rancière then ultimately encountered the writings of 19th century workers in archives. It was an untimely discovery, one filled with a strange sentiment of similarity, namely that these workers were also intellectuals as he was, 
that their activity as militants was inseparable from their philosophizing about all kinds of questions. And this is a story that, like a Conradian novel, has continued to haunt the rest of the Rancière story, which has been pursued as a single present in all its complex ramifications and enabled Rancière to push through to the end of his chimera. Thank you.